hour number two. We have a lot to talk about that's going to be very interesting, and it probably is affecting more of you than you would guesstimate. If you were asked, how many people do you think are being actually influenced by remote mind control, uh, EMF manipulation, neural modulation of your, your system, and not only your physical system, but your, your emotional and belief systems as well, you probably would guess far fewer. This is a, a very major blanket-wide operation that's going on, and it's being refined and advanced technologically probably every day. They're working on this around the clock, make no mistake about it. So lots to talk about. The technical name for the program conversation will be CIA, DOD, how they use the occult, haunted houses, and other spoofing tactics against mind control victims to manipulate their belief systems. This is going to be very interesting. And back to talk about that and much more is Brian Two T E W who is standing by, well, hopefully he's sitting down somewhere in South America. You there, Brian? I am, Jeff. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. Glad to have you back, and it's good to hear you. Very interesting field of playing, literally, with the belief systems of people, which suggests, of course, was it real or is it Memorex, i.e., my memories? Am I, do I have memories that don't exist in reality? Are these implanted memories, or are they real memories? And after a while, as a targeted individual, you begin to scratch your head, I would think, about uh, all that, and, and really wonder about yourself. Wouldn't that cause self-doubts with some people who are particularly viciously targeted? Uh, yes. Uh, remember, if, if you remember that, uh, you know, mind control technologies of the CIA and Department of Defense are based on three things, neuroscience, psychology, and satanic ritual abuse. Basically, they've taken neuroscience and they've married it to the occult. Okay, so when you so, say occult, we're talking SRA, satanic ritual abuse, which is most commonly inflicted on, uh, on young children, five and six years of age. That's usually the cutoff point before their, their initial personality uh, is formatted within them. Uh, they get in there and, and crack them into pieces when they're young, and then they control them for the rest of their lives. Sometimes it happens right. later on. But that's uh, that's what you are pointing to when you're talking about the occult. Okay. Well, when I talk about satanic ritual abuse and the occult, I'm talking about two different things with regard to mind control. When you're talking about satanic ritual abuse, you're talking about sleep deprivation, sensory overload, sensory deprivation, uh, the, street theater, the street theater will involve lies, coercion, physical and psychological trauma, sexual abuse. They will target the, the belief system of the victim. We talked about this last uh, few weeks ago to, 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 for two reasons. To determine first what the victim or the community who is targeted can maintain as truth. And secondly, to determine how to subdue or to radicalize that person or that community's belief system. And so uh, they use, you know, these, these spoofing tactics, the occult haunted houses, possessions, uh, you know, it, it, demonic possession is real, but not, it is not, you know, it does not occur to the extent that the religious believe it to happen here in America. Many of the possessions are just scripted mind games. Uh, people who are suffering from altars, uh, alter, uh, basically they fragment the core personality of the victim. And they create these alter personalities. It's, it's called, there are different uh, uh, names for it. But using extreme psychological trauma, they force the victim through yeah. the, 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 the psychological and physical trauma being tailored to the, to the victim's belief system. If the victim is a, a Christian, it'll be demon based hauntings. If the victim is a Muslim, it will be jinn based hauntings, and so forth. So now, when you, the, you, Brian, when you mention. Uh, and this term is is important, I think, for everyone to understand. Alters, alter personalities, alter, uh, alternative personalities. They're not entirely different personalities. They're like shades of uh, of any color you can imagine. Different shades and different mm, resonances. They're variations. But they're not radical necessarily. Completely radically changed personalities. That that's important. Well, 
it depends again on the on the on the neuro programming. That's what they right. Do that they, they can do anything. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Right. They they wall off the alter personalities. It's called uh, it's called artificially induced multiple personality disorder, and there are other names that they use. Oh, to interesting. So A I M P D artificially induced multiple personality disorder, otherwise known as DID right now, uh, dissociative right. identity disorder. Okay, interesting. So, so much of the much of the street theater with regard to the to the uh, to mind control technologies of the CIA and Department of Defense, you know, target the belief systems of their victims, and the scripted mind games, you know, are based on the haunted house, you know, God, angels, Satan, demons. Uh, etc. In order to create extreme psychological fear and paranoia in the victim, they did this to me. Okay, before I caught on, that that's necessary in trauma-based mind control technologies for those technologies to be effective. So the main objective would be to use to tailor the trauma to the victim's belief system and make the victim believe they're the victim of a haunting, uh, and then cause extreme psychological fear and paranoia forcing the victim to begin to physically and psychologically shut down, no longer be able to function and survive in society. Um, so it's, it's a brutal process. Um, it's necessary uh, for trauma-based mind control to isolate the victim in order to minimize any external interference, in order to force the, the, the mind control victim, the trauma-based mind control victim, to internalize or to internally focus on the neuroprogramming. So in order to do that, they convince the victim that they're a, you know, they're the victim of a haunting or a possession. And they can manipulate the anatomy of the victim using, you know, by modulation of the stream of energy, this fabricated and falsified stream of energy. They can, they can cause the victim's eyes to become dilated. So when the victim looks in the mirror, they believe they're, you know, they're demon possessed. The, 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 the voices that they're hearing are demons. Well, that, that's um, interesting. So, There's another aspect to that, and that's, uh, the musculature of the face can actually uh, be changed. Uh, some muscles can tighten up, some can loosen, and you, you can change the entire expression that you would see in the mirror if you're looking at yourself and you are a TI and they want to play that game with you. Yeah, dilating the pupils is one thing. Uh, they can actually change the physical look of your, your appearance. And make the victim believe they're the victim of a possession or a haunting. You know, sounds and voices can be forced into the targeted individual's perception, thoughts, real and fabricated memories, impulse injections, known as impulse sequencing, uh, a combination of all of that achieved through, through uh, streams of electromagnetic low frequency waves interfacing with the victim's mind. So basically, they, 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 you know, they, want, they turn the brain of the victim into their very own visual, verbal, and auditive communication system. And so, basically, the, the objective is is to make the victim believe, become dependent upon the system's output, meaning the victim believes that these responses, that he's, these voices that he's hearing, these, these thoughts that keep occurring in his mind or her mind, that they're, that they're demons or angels or, or perhaps the god of their choice is speaking to them, either in, in the form of a dream or a vision, intuitively in some way, telling them to do something, to, to pitch them unwarily, pitch them to throw them into some type of action or access sequence in order to force them to begin to verbalize or engage in some type of related action regarding to that remote neural attack, whatever it may be, which is tailored to the belief system of the victim. So they use the, they use the occult, haunted houses, and other spoofing tactics to determine what can that victim maintain as true. They did it to me. They used uh, what are called wake-up visions. This is before I caught on to the technology. Okay, I, I, I was watching on, on television. I was watching, you know, uh, programs on the, on the television. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead. Fine. I, I was watching programs on the television related to demons and spirits and ghosts. Um, and so they, they picked up on this. A supercomputer was monitoring my television viewing habits. And, and then that night, uh, that morning, the next morning, I woke up and suddenly a man, uh, a giant man standing in a, a robe with a gold medallion around his neck said, time to wake up, Brian. And I woke up. And within huh. a few seconds, he dis totally disappeared from the visual field. Huh. And that went on. Right. We may have lost, uh, lost you. Hold on. My visual field. Okay, there you go. So 
he just vanished from your visual field. Right, and then you know there would be other uh, you know there would be other visual sequences uh -huh. involving ghosts and demons that they were in, they were basically they were, I learned that they were able to manipulate the visual cortex of the victim. Oh my! With streams wow. of energy, to causing you, you, the victim. Yeah, you said it right. They use your entire consciousness, your mental, auditory, and visual consciousness, all of it, as a as a playground, a sandbox. They can do anything they want with it. Wow. Not aware that he's a victim of mind control technology. It's easy to do. It's easy sure. to achieve. And it's there's also denial. Mo most victims uh, in the beginning want to deny it. I would imagine uh, it's not something you want to rush to embrace. So there's a denial factor, and a lot of people spend years and years, and they're being messed with, and they just can't. And it's understandable they can't accept the fact that there just might be something interfering with them from the outside. Well, remember that. You know, mind control is based on CIA and, and Department of Defense. Mind control technologies are based off this fabricated and falsified stream of energy. Correct. This bit yeah. stream which contains data. So they target the, the victim's brain with this remote neural monitoring and remote neural manipulation, which works really well with, you know, dream modulation, induced visions, nightmares, to make the mind control victim believe the god of their choice is speaking to them or angels or demons, uh, such as in the form of a dream or vision, you know. And for my, a lot of mind control victims, you know, those dreams will become nightmares. Objects in the house will begin to move on their own, which they accomplish. The CIA and, and DIA contractors, these cognitive researchers, can move objects in your house, open doors and close doors, move furniture, etc., uh, through a, a process called synthetic telekinesis. They can simply move move the objects with streams of energy. So it appears as if the objects are being moved by ghosts or demons. So okay, that has to... Is that something that would be done uh, relatively close proximity to the, 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 the actual venue where the operation is, is being manifested? In other words, there's a van across the street from your house. You see things moving in your house. Or is this done at, uh, at great distance with some kind of X-ray image ring uh, imaging with uh, you know, maybe infrared, whatever, uh, so they can see inside your house. They'd have to be able to see what they're doing. Is my point? Well, they they can do this through a process of through a process called telemetry. They can see every object in your house in 3D living color um, using a process called telemetry, which is basically a stream of microwaves which ricochets, they bounce off every object in your house, uh -huh. and basically mm -hmm. they, they turn your home into you know. A glass wall. Uh, they can just see into every room right. uh, by using microwaves. It's called telemetry. Okay? Oh, it's like, so it's like your, your, your home would be a, a container, uh, and they're bouncing uh, infinite numbers of uh, telemetry waves, millimeter waves perhaps, off everything in the house, which creates for them a 3D color monitored model. image. Right. Exactly. Full Correct. model. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, manipulation of the victim's anatomy, it can be done, uh, and, and, and mental substrate, the brain of the victim, it can be done from thousands of miles away. When you're talking about the moving of furniture inside the house, there has to be some degree of proximity uh, to, to for, for, the, for example, for the purposes of verification, uh, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. you know, but from great distances, you know, hot and cold sensations, voices, sounds, images, you know, all of that can be, is, is replicated to create a haunting right. based on uh, based on the mind control victim's belief system. I got okay? it. Yeah. So, All right. All right. That's good. Let, hold, let me hold you right there. When you're talking about uh, children, breaking children down at the age of five and six, their belief systems really aren't formed yet, not like an adult or a young adult. So you've got a whole different paradigm to work in. But we're talking about what age group primarily, Brian? How would you let's let's put this in a box if we can what, 18, 15, 16 years of age and up? They target children starting from three to six. Yeah. Before the core person, before the core personality, the core personality has got set. Got it. Got it. Got uh, it. With extreme trauma, physical and psychological abuse, um, sexual abuse, it's, it's, it's not a, a nice topic to talk about. It's beyond, uh, it uh, it's beyond description. It is beyond uh, horrific. Uh, it happens all the time. Uh, I can't even begin 
to understand uh, how people survive it and, and continue to function. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that many of them are fragmented and the more functional fragments are used to carry that person forward in life. Otherwise, they would just be a, a dithering, blithering piece of, uh, of complete paranoid trauma. Well, correct. Um, you know, they need to get to the child early in order to create multiple personality disorder, in order to fragment the child's persona so that they can uh, wall off those personalities, those alters, with right. extreme trauma. And then through psychological probing techniques, they can begin to locate each alter and begin to repro pre reprogram those alter personalities. So, How many you know, alter so personalities, uh, Brian, are we talking about? Uh, what is the potential? What's a, a round number that you can say? Can, um, can it be infinite? I guess it can be, since they're just shades of uh, a color, variations. They can be just a degree off. There could be hundreds of them. Again, it would depend, again, on the, on the psychology of the victim. Uh, uh -huh. uh, again, I mean, the more trauma that they're subjected to, the more... The brain has a tendency to protect itself from extreme trauma sure. by fragmenting. By, sure. by the core person begin to fragment. And that's, that's, just a, that's just a built in mechanism of protection uh, from extreme psychological trauma. So, you know, uh, again, uh, there, was, there have been some reports of people with as with this few as, you know, two or three, and some reports with, of people with, you know, 40 or 50. Whether that's true or not, that's, the, that's what we're seeing and hearing mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the resources that we're getting on the Internet. Um, they did this to me. One night, they were targeting my belief system, had been targeting, targeting my belief system for quite some time. Uh, but I, I, got, I, got, I caught on to what they were doing, and I trained myself to, to remain motionless in the bed with my eyes closed when, when I woke up in the morning. Wow. And I was, able to start, I was able to start seeing some of the dream modulation, some of the nightmares that, that they were using, the chatterbot, the, uh, the neuro-linguistic programming. And one uh, visual sequence they were using was, the, was a solar eclipse. In my mind, I was, you know, in my dreams, this went on for about 15 seconds before the supercomputer realized that I was awake. Right. And then it stopped there. And uh, there was a giant sun being eclipsed by a total disk of darkness, slowly eclipsed, uh, like you would see a solar eclipse. And then the chatterbot that was using neurolinguistic programming saying, saying, Jesus is darkness, Jesus is darkness, Jesus is darkness, over and over in a looping pattern. Uh, to target, to manipulate my belief system. They want to learn how to subdue, my, you know, they wanted to subdue my, my, my belief, my faith. They I want understand. They want to learn how to achieve that. Right. And so uh, that's just one example of, of many things that they've done. You, you know, um, you're, you know, excuse me, but your extraordinary ability to figure out in general terms what was going on with you uh, might have uh, caused some of them to go away. I guess they didn't in your case, but that would be, uh, once they'd been made, uh, you'd think that they'd pull up stakes maybe and go look at somebody else, because you figured it out. That's pretty impressive. If the victim can realize, get a basic understanding of the technology before the cognitive model, the copycat parallel twin personality, that's what I mean by cognitive model. The copycat parallel twin personality is built inside the database of the supercomputer. If you can figure out what's going wrong, you can begin to, you know, to counteract their technology. You can begin to disrupt and defeat their technology. Um, but unfortunately, most victims have no idea. Again, it's a deadly game of deception and manipulation. And by the time most victims realize that they, you know, these are not really hauntings, that God is not really speaking to me, uh, it's, it's almost too late. It's almost too late. They did this to me in, in 1997 in the Cayman Islands. I had flown in from Nicaragua, and I was walking past the police station on my way to the British West Indies campus of the University of Liverpool. And I passed a man and a woman standing in the entrance of the police station. Well, I knew all the police. I knew the chief of police there. I went, you know, I went to law school with him, uh, and that's why I was down there. And, you know, the, Suddenly I heard a voice, an omnipotent voice say, speak to them. Well, there was no one anywhere near around me. 
So uh-huh. I knew it wasn't, you know, I was no one was talking to me. Right. And I stopped dead in my tracks, and I heard the voice again. And so I began walking back and forth, thinking God was speaking to me, telling me to talk to this man and woman who were standing in the entrance of the police station. Finally, I walked away thinking I was hearing things. And for years, for many years, I regretted that. Only, only to eventually realize that I had become a non-consensual human experimentee in mind control technologies of the CIA and Department of Defense. But at the time, they had convinced me that the God of my choice was speaking to me by way of this fabricated, falsified stream of energy interfacing with my, with my brainwave patterns. Very good. It's called the voice, voice of God weapons. Okay. All right. Very good. Hold on a minute. We're going to take a break and come right back. And uh, if you still have your cell phone there, you might try and dial in. And we're, we can hear you fine. It's okay. It's just not the kind of quality that, that I think we'd all like to have. But it works. It's okay. So uh, back in a minute. Hold on with Brian, too. Talking with Brian too, remarkable material and information for you. Just if you don't believe it, that's fine. Just let it percolate. Just understand it's been put on the table for you. If you ever want to look at it, it's there. If you ever want to listen again, you can hear it. Okay, Brian, uh, let's carry on. This is a very interesting thing that if someone believes in ghosts and spirits, they can play to that and they can really make that person dance if they want to. For example. And, and even if they don't, for example, if the victim is an atheist, then, you know, they'll tailor the, the uh, scripted mind games and the remote neural attacks based on in the occult haunted houses and other spoofing tactics against the atheist or the agnostic. For example, the atheist will walk outside and see a UFO over his house. Or, or the agnostic will suddenly see aliens walking in the yard. Well, they're not, you know, they're not aliens, and, and they're not UFOs. They're holograms, okay? And then suddenly, you know, the thoughts and impulses that, that they're injecting into the victim's mind, these voice of God weapons, synthetic telepathy, et cetera, yeah. will become very subtle and subliminal. You mean that, uh, that, that E.T. sitting across the, uh, the studio here in the chair is not real, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. You're not real. Go away. You're not real. That's the, that's the difference between a hologram and, and the manipulation of the visual cortex. Uh-huh. If they target the visual cortex of the victim with streams of electromagnetic low frequency waves, causing the victim to see things which are not there, well, within a short period of time, just generally just a few seconds, that vision, that vision, that that image will disappear from the visual field of the victim, but a hologram will not disappear. It will stay. It will stay within the visual field of the victim. Okay. So that, again, the, the objective is, you know, because the technology is too advanced to be from Earth, it must be God or it must be aliens that are speaking to him. You know, the, the, the victim um, again, more subtle and more subliminal at first, to make the mind control victim believe that God of their religion is speaking to them. Mm-hmm. wanting them to do or say something. Got it, got to, it. To pitch them into some type of action or access sequence, which will always be tied to the doctrines of their faith, the doctrines of what they believe. Sure. So the profile, the profile, you know, people who know little or nothing about mind control and even less about religion are extremely susceptible to these cognitive magic tricks of these CIA and DOD operatives, these contractors, especially as, you know, they, they play into their previous religious, religious experiences. Because remember, religious experiences are by human nature intense and life-changing. So they're able to manipulate the victim to begin to shape the thoughts and behavior of the, of the mind control victim by, by, by the manipulation of their, of their belief system. Uh-huh. When, you know, the, once the, if the victim's not aware they're being the target of this constant mental manipulation, the supercomputer begins to shape the thoughts and behavior of the victim either to attempt to restrict their thoughts or behavior by blocking and injection methods or to to force them into some type of, you know, religious action such as a pilgrimage or a prayer or, you know, a jihad bomber, you know. How about how about is. how about 
just playing with somebody uh, in a in a non religious sense, but an emotional sense. Now let's say you can make somebody jealous. There's one of the most primitive of all human emotions. They could drive somebody insane with jealousy if they wanted to, because they'd feed it with paranoia and the electromagnetic frequencies would would induce that response. Pretty soon, and I think we've all read the play Othello, uh, Othello was driven completely mad by this this fear and this paranoia that Desdemona was cheating on him. And uh, it wasn't happening. But it didn't convince him otherwise, and he ended up killing her. And then when he realized it all, he, he killed himself. So, in other words, the full range of human emotions can be tweaked and made uh, extremely intense with this kind of intervention. Right, exactly. So, because, you know, any set of brain waves can be captured, remotely captured from great distances by these supercomputers, then held and perpetually replayed in the victim's brain, they, the system can capture the motivational impulses, the, that set of brain waves for jealousy, for that particular set of emotions. And once it determines, you know, it verifies that this is the, the correct frequency to to solicit the emotion, the motivational impulse of jealousy, it can then inject that same set of brain waves, uh, electromagnetic this bit via this bidirectional bit stream. It can then inject that same set of brain waves back into the subconscious of the victim over and over in a looping pattern to drive the victim mad, to drive the victim to mentally interrogate the victim, to torture, to harass, to distract the victim, to torture the victim. Oh, destroy their to- destroy their life. Of course. And that's the objective. You know, at what point, the point which their life is destroyed, their health is destroyed, their careers are destroyed, their families are destroyed, they themselves are destroyed. That's an important metric in the training, research, and development of these CIA and DOD contractors. Uh-huh. You, know, you know, they target, for, for example, they, they'll target the, uh, the anatomy of a victim to determine, you know, at what point will the victim suffer congestive heart failure, stroke, uh, or some other tertiary disease. And at the point at which the victim does die or becomes incapacitated, that's an important metric in their training, research, and development. Well, so too. That's the physical attacks, but so too are the psychological attacks, the psychological trauma. At what point can they get the victim to begin to verbalize, speak out about, or to begin to engage in some type of related action or access sequence regarding, you know, his faith or his, his belief, or, you know, his, his for example, uh, the motivational impulses uh, of jealousy, uh, of um guilt, of compassion, of remorse. All of these are important metrics right. in their training, research, and development. Right, right. Paranoia, fear, uh, narcissism, the whole thing. Uh, and variations of each one of those that are countless. So, there you right. go. And, and, and that's, what, that's what the system will do. It's called verification. Once the system determines a coherent pattern of thought for that mm-hmm. particular emotion, be it jealousy or uh, regret, remorse, whatever, okay, at that point, once that coherent pattern is determined, they force the victim into the repeated emotions of jealousy, the repeated emotions of depression and rage and anger and compassion and uh, remorse and regret, etc. And then over and over until they can generate enough emotional responses of the victim that they can begin to correlate all of those responses of the victim, those synaptic responses, mm-hmm. into what are called response statistics. And then they take that statistical data, those responses, and they determine a coherent pattern of thought for jealousy, for love, for hate, for rage, for paranoia, for fear. Right. Okay, and then once they determine a coherent pattern of thought, they begin to inject, take those brain waves and inject them. The supercomputer now, it's not, it's not a contractor. There are hive mind teams involved, but most of the torture and assassination is done by a supercomputer. So the supercomputer will then take that set of brain waves for that particular emotion and inject it back into the subconscious of the victim over and over, okay, in a looping pattern to achieve direct behavioral control over the victim. Mm. to begin to shape the thoughts and behavior of the victim. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you're dealing with, you know, um, uh, you know, dreams and visions which are tailored to your specific belief system. To, so what, the, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll artificially inject these impulses, these thoughts, these emotions, the supercomputer will, 
into the mind control victim's brain. And they'll, sometimes they'll accompany it by a directed energy, pulse of energy, causing a goose flesh experience uh, to give the victim a, a eureka or hallelujah experience to make the victim believe they're the ones that came up with the religious experience, when in fact, it was all artificial to begin with. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. All artificial to begin with, but as real as it could be, if you're that person, how are you going to get in there and, and really do any kind of acid testing on these emotions? You just won't know. You won't know. Because the fine line between reality and the artificial augmentation is almost invisible. And, and they can, they can push these things into somebody, I would imagine. Again, I'm not a professional. Uh, at the speed of light, uh, as quickly as they want to, and they can, they can turn somebody into a, kind of a pinwheel of, of, of mania. They can just or drive them versa. nuts. Right, or vice versa. They can actually, you know, once a cognitive model, a copycat parallel twin personality of the victim's will, intellect, and emotion is finally achieved, built inside the database of the supercomputer through the, through the, you know, reverse engineering of the, of the synaptic responses of the victim, they can begin to, you know, by speeding up the model, this cognitive model, this copycat parallel twin personality, they can turn the victim into the worst satanic monster imaginable. That's how they create all these shooters. Or vice versa, you know, they can slow down the model inside the database and they can turn the finest athlete into a human vegetable. Um, and that's, that's their objective. It's called direct behavioral control. It starts with, you know, forcing the victim to become dependent upon the system's output. But it ends in the manipulation of the daily motives and emotional perceptions of the victim so that the victim is under constant 24-7 control of the supercomputer and right. has no idea. None. Oh, no, I can understand that, how that would work. Yeah. And that's what MK Ultra. a lot of what MKUltra was based on was the psychological torture and sensory deprivation, sexual and verbal abuse, uh, but, you know, using the supernatural and the occult to, to basically delve into the depths of the, of the human brain, you know, to determine, you know, how, how can a person, how can a person, uh, how can their entire personality, their persona be altered? You know, they want to turn a Muslim into a Jew or a, or vice versa. They want to turn a, a Christian into an atheist or, uh, you know. Uh, I got it. Okay. Person. So, Brian, yeah. at, at, at this point in time, uh, you're talking about R&D, research and development. They've been doing this for such a long time now. They've got to be way down the road on total control of somebody. This is probably child's play for them now, isn't it? Well, uh, again, I, I mean, they, the human brain has been mapped. The human brain is totally controllable. Uh, and people that say, no, I, I don't believe that, I believe in free will, they're simply ignorant of the technology. Okay? They can basically achieve uh, with the physical anatomy anything they want. And once, you know, they've reached a certain step, you know, with, between the memory references and the system's output, this remote neural attacks. Sure. Once they reach a point where they can, you know, that they believe that the, the, the cognitive model is complete, then they, they, they begin attacking the thought triggered attacks. And because the technology is designed to mimic the normal cognitive behavior of the victim, the victim can't realize, can't determine that his own thoughts are artificial to begin with. So the answer is no. I mean, there's no, there, there is no such thing as free will anymore. And because the brain is completely controllable, they can achieve whatever desired result they want once they have, you know, once the RNM system has complete, has completed that cognitive model. That's when they begin to abuse you. That's why the, the torture is designed to be so brutal. Precisely so no one will believe it is happening. So they're going to abuse you in every way possible to convince you that they're in control. But if you understand, if you have a basic understanding of the technology, you know, electromagnetic low frequency waves interfacing with nanotech, then you can begin to counter what they're doing. Uh, but you know, if, if people don't understand from the, from the outset that they're targeted, there's no way for them to, to contrast the system suggestions, these mental suggestions from their own normal memory of thought process. So, you know, they're, they're a sitting duck. If they can't test and validate right. memory to determine what's true, what are their normal memory and thought process is from the artificial impulse injections and remote neural attacks, there's no way for them to counter the technology. So they can literally make, using the occult, haunted houses. I saw uh, uh, a news uh, media uh, uh, on the Internet. I watched the, 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 the British news was talking about there was a ghost in one of these castles. And they showed a ghost, you know, opening a door and sticking his head out. 
I saw and that. I thought, how, I, thought, I thought, how ridiculous. Since when does a ghost need to open a door and look outside to see if it's raining? You know, uh, but people will believe these, 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 uh, these, these cognitive magic tricks. People will believe, mm-hmm. and they're used because they want to determine who will believe and who won't. They want to determine what the public can maintain as truth. So they engage in these haunted houses. You know, I'm not saying that they're, they're that all haunted houses are, are you know just the CIA you know magic tricks. But I don't believe there are you know, you know these haunted. I don't believe ghosts and demons haunt houses. I believe they haunt people if they're real. Okay, but you know they're going to use these haunted houses and these other spooking tactics to constantly run you the victim through a verification routine to determine what it is you can determine mm-hmm. is true from from artificial. So where are they right now, Brian? Okay, they're pushing people to the maximum. Do they push them and break them just for amusement? Or are they doing it still to try to find out how to do this on a mass basis? I guess they're still doing a lot of research and development, but they do have a pretty good handle on it, at least in terms of individual manipulation. Well, you know... uh because we don't understand fully the hardware that they're using, the, these exoskeletal supercomputers. And remember, a computer multiplexer routes the signal to a tower, a satellite, or a mobile platform. And then the tower, satellite, or mobile platform relays the signal, the stream of energy, to the victim's brain. And because we don't fully understand the hardware that, that, that they're using, there's no way for us to, you know, to fully gauge just how far you know, advanced and sophisticated the technology is. Obviously, there are a lot of people crying out about this, you know, the, the organized stalking, the direct energy attacks. So it can no longer be dismissed as mere public hysteria. And we know they're working, you know, all the way up to, to include, you know, all 318 million uh, Americans uh, in, in, the, in the technology. But uh, it's hard for us to gauge and say, where are they, when we don't understand fully the hardware they're using to begin with. We have some idea of the software. Okay, but through the scientists and the resources and research, we've been able to determine that the, one of the uh, software platforms Dr. Duncan talked about was MIND. Uh, it's an acronym which stands for Magnetic Integrated Neuron Duplicator. It's basically the a software program inside the supercomputer which basically engages in whole brain emulation. It breaks every synaptic r- response, measures, mm-hmm. gauge, mm-hmm. identifies, develops, and then downloads it back into its system. Right. And then there's another another software they're using uh, called TAMI, which stands another acronym, which stands for Thought and Memory Interface. Uh, and again, it's a second generation platform built on top of mine, Dr. Robert Duncan said. And then they, you know, there are other software programs they're using, such as Satan, uh, which stands for Silent Assassination Through Amplified Neurons. Uh, basically, the Department of Defense, my former employer, loves to name their weapon systems using, you know, religious and mythical metaphors. So because we, you know, we, 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 we can get some, some idea of the software they're using, we still have no idea of fully gauging where they are because we don't understand the hardware. So it it doesn't have to be a beam directed right at somebody's cranium. They can, I, as as I understand it, there can be a, a a broad brush approach emitting a lot of RF specifically tuned for that person to achieve a certain result, and it can be just generally broadcast. That person has a, his or her own biological resonant frequency. Uh, it is also suggested that they're using DNA now because it has its own unique signature that can be tuned in on. So they can broadcast this from a, a satellite, uh, a tower, over a, a many, many miles. And yet only that particular person, the targeted individual with that particular physiological signature or DNA signature, will actually pick up the sent, the sent message, correct? That is correct. The the digital receiver is the human brain. Okay, so you could be standing in a room full of a hundred people. The stream of energy, the stream of electromagnetic. It's everyone, but you're the only one who gets it. That's what I was saying. Yeah. It okay. would it would hit it would pass right through and around everyone, and they would not even sense anything. But the victim would absorb the energy and feel its effects because only the victim possesses that specific brainwave signature, sure. which the sure. stream of energy is tuned into. Okay. So the victim collapses in pain, and everyone wants to know what's wrong. You know, um, it's, it's you know, it's, so they did it. They did it to in Palm Springs to about fifty uh, homosexual men that began targeting uh, these, these homosexual men in Palm Springs, California, uh, with voice of God weapons, synthetic telepathy, uh, not so much torture, but a lot of psychological trauma. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to determine 
they wanted to determine if they could, if these homosexual men, notice they were all one specific group, okay, uh, one, one, one specific study group. They didn't tar- target heterosexuals. They didn't, they, didn't, they, targeted, they didn't target bisexuals. They targeted homosexuals. And they wanted to be able to, to, to determine what it would take to, to force these, 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 these homosexuals to turn from their homosexuality for fear of God. Got for it. fear of hell, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For, you know. So they used these spoofing tactics on these on these homosexuals, uh, and it made the news. It was on ABC News, um, hmm. and uh, you know you, you can't have you know fifty different homosexual men hearing the same thing, you know, suffering from the same symptoms. They call it you know mere public hysteria. It's not. It is. Uh, it, it is. It's, you know. It's, the, the, what they do is they force the, they, they target you. They, their, their technology works best in what's called theta state. You just, you're talking about the different states of the brain, you're alpha, beta, delta, theta. Well, theta state is somewhere between four and seven hertz, okay, and where, the, where, where the victim is either super relaxed or drowsy, okay, but not yet asleep. Right. That's where their technology is most effective. Okay, so what they'll do is they'll drop the victim down into a super relaxed, the system, the RNN supercomputer will modulate the stream of energy and begin to lower the victim, drop the victim down into a super relaxed or drowsy state. That's at theta. Which point, theta, theta state, right. At which point the victim is so drowsy, he can no longer recognize modification of his active memory in real time to fight sure. back against the system's influences. Got so they begin, uh, well, they, they begin to hypnotize the victim. They begin to walk the victim through, you know, the neuro linguistic programming, the, the visual and verbal sequences to try to repattern the brain of the victim. In the case of these homosexual men, they were what they were trying to do is repattern them into heterosexual. They didn't really care, you know. They just wanted to see, you know, what at what point, at what, what what metric would, would 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 rise that would show that this was possible. And they were not successful, but that was just one of many tests that they've used. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Theta state, very important people to understand. They're going to they're gonna wake you up in the morning, okay? Or as you're laying down, as you're, as you're at a position of rest, the supercomputer, before it begins to attack you, is going to lower you down into a super relaxed or drowsy state where their technology is most effective. And what they're, what, basically what they're doing is electromagnetic hypnotism, okay? They're repatterning your brain at this super relaxed, drowsy state. To, uh, and then, then, of course, they have to use the... The, you know, the organized stalking, we're talking about, you know, the occult haunted houses and other spoofing tactics. We're not talking about organized stalking at all. We're talking about gaslighting, okay? And, and you know, using, you know, uh, the haunted house or demon possessions or voice of God weapons, et cetera, to make the victim believe the God of their choice is speaking to them is a very important metric in determining how to repattern a person's brain. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so again, what, what, yeah, what do you tell people about learning to recognize when they're being messed with? Are there any general rules of thumb that, that we can give people right now? We don't, have, we only have a minute or so till the break, but we want to try and give people the tools to determine if they are targeted, if they are being messed with. And some of these people are, of course, will be, driven to go to a, a, a psychiatric counselor or they'll be put on uh, antidepressant medicaid their lives will be ruined by this destroyed uh and they there's nothing really wrong with them except that which is being programmed into them makes them feel like there's something wrong so how do they defend well, against this well because the, the, the technology can be achieved at lower intensities uh you know most people who have no idea of the technology at all that it exists they can't fight back um, people that are, you know, that are, were, are targeted at higher intensities. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Torture. They can begin to realize they're being targeted. One of the ways you can t- determine you're being targeted is by learning to read active memory. And reading active memory is simply testing and validating your own memory and thought process to determine whether it's real or artificial. All right, all right. We're going to ta- let's say uh, hold on to that thought. We have to take a little bit of a pause here. Brian will come back and and go into. Uh, R-A-M in just a few minutes we'll try and give you some ideas on if you're really thinking that maybe there's something wrong with you maybe there isn't something wrong with you maybe there's something wrong being done to you alright so hold on we'll come right back with Brian 2 in just a couple okay welcome back talking to 
Ryan Tu. That's T E W. He is in uh, South America and uh, looking for safety and security, as so many of us are. We're talking about some extraordinary things having to do with mind control, programming, uh, a lifetime of literally uh, living under the thumb of technology. And you don't know who you are. You don't know what's being done to you. And unless you're really skillfully uh, attuned to doing what we just began to talk to uh, and about at the end of the uh, first hour. Brian, can you hear me all right still? Are we okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, yeah. Okay, very good, yeah. All right, there now. Some background noise. There is some background noise on your side. I don't know what it is. Oh, who knows? Who knows? Uh, it's probably something just going to you. I think if it were endemic to the entire output, I'd be getting emails uh, already from people. That's what usually happens. We can't hear you. We got whatever. Okay, let me ask okay. you. Let me ask you this question. Now there are people who are mind controlled in a very severe and substantial way who deny it, uh, never realize it, refuse to even entertain the idea, and yet they do. They do strange things. Uh, a lot. Some of them I've read these accounts. Some will go to a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist and look for help that way, but without the ability to really identify the problem, I don't know how much good at all a psychologist or psychiatrist could do for anybody. Is, is that, a, is that a, a tool that some of these people can, can look to for help? I don't see how, frankly, because most of the psychiatrists and psychologists, if they're not involved with the evil game of mind control, satanic ritual abuse, are probably in denial of the whole potential. So what do, what do we do? Well, that's the da- that's the danger of people not understanding and and uh, cooperating with the system because you know the point the, because the system's building a cognitive model of your brain. The point will come where the victim can no longer recognize he's under attack um, because the technology is designed to mimic, I said, your normal cognitive behavior. So to answer your question from before the break and and then to tie into what you're saying now. It, it all begins with the victim's ability to read active memory. If the, if the victim cannot read active memory, test and validate their own memory, then there's no way for them to determine they're being attacked. Okay, these uh, cognitive researchers can can just turn them into mere puppets uh, with with this technology. Sure. And and you re- reading active memory means looking for patterns. You know, if you're, you know, the technology is designed is based on pattern recognition. Okay, they're constantly looking to develop patterns, coherent patterns of thought. You know, mind control is about decoding thought patterns. Organized stalking is about, you know, choice reference patterns. So you, 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 you're able to identify you're under attack by the technology by looking, by testing and validating memory, meaning looking for patterns. In your own behavior, in your own behavior. Let's say you become, you become obsessed about something or someone uh, to a degree that is obviously repetitive. Uh, It fits a template. It's not something that's random human life experience. It's it's over and over. That would be a key, would it not? It would. In fact, um, you know, that if unless you're obsessive compulsive and you suffer from OCD, yeah. obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, there comes a point in time when you have to, this is not my normal memory and thought process. Why am I obsessing about this, you know, this, this, this object or this person? You know, why is this thought continually being, you know, forced through my head over and over? You begin to see the pattern develop, you know, a pattern of the same. Uh, yeah, or, or uh, it could be, could it not be, emotions. Brian? A pattern of uh, completely irrational response to an otherwise rational day-to-day thing in life. Completely irrational to the extent that you see people get uh, screaming, rages, yelling. Uh, it makes no logical, linear, intellectual sense at all. None. That's another tip, I would think, the, the exposition of an outward manifestation of a severe emotional upset uh and irrationality right well they don't force you to do anything now they, they can't force you uh but that's not how the te- technology is designed to work they, the technology is designed 
to, to make you believe, that, to become dependent. We talked about this already. So they give you the desire. They give you, you know, the motivational impulse of what are, it may be, you know, rage, it may be anger. So you embrace it, you embrace it thinking it's a, a willing reflex when in fact it's not. You're triggered. Right, you're triggered. But unless you can read active memory, there's no way for you to determine that those triggers are happening. Very let, good let point. Got example. it. Got it. Let me, let me give an example. The system, for example, will will make you, so let's use forced speech, for example. Um, forced speech, they don't force you to speak. Okay, they use previous memory references of whatever your conversation was in the past. And then they take those previous me memory references, which were captured, remotely captured, and they're now, the system, the RNM supercomputer is now injecting them back into your subconscious to make you, to give you the desire to start verbalizing, to engage in verbalization about a, 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 that particular subject, that particular remote neural attack. Uh -huh. So so for speech is a good example of what you're talking about. They, they, they don't, they, they give you, the, the, you have a strong urge or desire to speak at higher levels about a specific subject, a, about a specific memory attack. That's a high frequency attack. And you have a, a low urge of basic motivation at baseline levels. That's a low frequency attack. So the supercomputer can, can, can disrupt your, your, your memory memory, your memory and thought process as you begin to formulate whatever you're talking about, yeah. whatever related statement, whatever, and, and it injects with, you know, nonsensical words or gibberish. So you, you, you know, you suddenly lose track of what you were thinking. It's called EDAM. It's called electronic dissolution of memory. It can be achieved three different ways. Hmm. They, they use a pulse of energy and hmm. suddenly you, you, know, you feel like your head's seizing up for a split second. And, and then, then, you know, the, after a split second, a second later, the, you go back to normal, right. but you cannot remember what you were talking about. At that point, the system begins to attack with remote, with these thought triggered attacks, blocking and injection methods. It blocks with, with, with a pulse of energy. It basically clears the neural pathways of your brain. And then it injects with this, fa with this fabrication or falsification to get you to start speaking about football or God or religion. But you were never in intended to do, to do that to begin with. But the system is giving you the desire, the motivation to speak about this particular subject. It's called forced speech. They don't force you to speak. They give you the desire. Same thing with other behavior, yelling and screaming like you were talking about. These, these uh, emotions of rage and anger, they do it to me all the time. They, they're using previous memory references of organized stalkers. They're, they're using the organized stalking to establish memory anchors. Okay, Once that memory anchor is set... Okay, it's captured and verified. The system begins to all night long. We will sit there and, and inject over and over in a looping pattern the same mem previous memory reference of the organized stalker, along with a motivational impulse of rage. So I'll just sit there on my bed. I, I suddenly start burning with rage every time I think about this organized stalker. You see what uh, it's doing? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, it works the same way as for speech. They don't force yeah. you. They don't now, the person to yell or scream. Here's the next. Here's the next question. We've got a supercomputer that's got a profile on somebody. A lot of people. Who's who's uh, who's programming the computer to become autonomous or a slave uh, to a, a caseworker or what? We've got to have people ultimately somewhere involved with selecting and instructing the computer what to do. Is it, would this be called a caseworker? What would it be called? Handlers and operators are, are high mind team members. Generally, uh, they have you know cognitive researcher will be someone who has some experience in the you know in the area of the mind, a, a degree of expertise in the memory and thought process. Okay. So these high mind team members that are involved. Uh, that are directing the paradigm against the victim are psychiatrists, psychologists, neuroscientists, etc. Okay, and it, they use a, a process called EEG heterodyning, uh, and basically by cloning their their uh, emotions, their sensations, their thoughts, etc. to the victim, they can manipulate the mental substrate of the victim and force the victim to react uh, in ways which the victim, if he's not aware, he's being targeted to begin with. They can achieve direct behavioral control over the victim. These high mind teams, I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're using, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, two interfaces to attack the victim, a brain-to-computer interface and an electronic brain-to-brain -brain interface. The electronic brain-to-brain -brain interface is what the high mind teams are using, okay? And that's how they, 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 uh, they achieve the, the EEG heterodyne to, to uh, control the victim. 
So unless the victim can read active memory, uh, it's easily to be it's easy for the victim to be fooled by the RN system because the influences are, the system will constantly force you to make minor choices. Okay, and you won't realize, you know, why you suddenly, you know, have you know constant desire for religion or God or, or sex, uh, because the system captured that that motivational impulse of, of lust, and it's now injecting that lust back into your subconscious over and over to force you in, to engage in a related action of sex or masturbation, etc., to achieve direct behavioral control over you. So the CIA and DIA hive mind teams are the ones, they're the handlers and the operators. They're the ones that take part in this process. And you're saying, okay. uh, uh, excuse me, for our listeners, you say it a little quickly, hive mind, H-I-V-E-M-I-N-D. Right, hive mind teams. They're, Got it. they're just, they're just uh, a group of three to six people who are, you know, for training, research, and development, who are dedicated to the trauma-based mind control victim. Most mind control victims do not have hive mind teams. Okay, there, there, there wouldn't be enough hive mind teams to go around. So many people are targeted, mm -hmm. but we do believe that most trauma-based victims do have hive mind teams dedicated to them every eight hours and eight-hour shifts, with some degree of overlap. They're they're dedicated to the victim, and and they're the ones that control the 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 gaslighting, the organized stalking, the direction of the paradigm against the victim. They're using uh, below them. They're using surveillance teams. And below the surveillance teams, you know, you have a whole all the way down to the, you know, litany of agencies and organizations and personnel that that are used at the local, state, and federal level, all the way down to the street level. Uh, but it's all controlled and directed uh, by these these hive mind teams, and they're literally, you know, right next to the victim, constantly trying to engage and interact with the victim. Okay, but they're using a virtual interface. It's like um, a vir if you put on okay, a virtual how, environment. Okay, give me an example of a virtual interface. They're not physically right next to the victim, so how do they do it? Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Okay, um, depends on what you know what they're doing to the victim. But a virtual interface, just think of a virtual headset. If you put a virtual headset on, you can see a virtual environment. Okay, you, you, you begin to see you know, an entirely new environment Okay, by putting on this virtual headset. They sell them at Best Buy and Okay. Walmart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, they don't need the headset. They have the, the electronic brain-to-brain -brain interface, the neurochip inside their body or their gear. So they're able to produce this, this virtual interface, with this virtual environment around them without the need for a headset. So with that virtual environment, they're able to pull up screens. You know, uh, the first screen will be, you know, your brain, the victim's brainwave signature, the victim's brainwave pattern. Then they'll pull up a parallel screen right next to that first screen, which will be the, the, the brainwave signature, the brainwave patterns of, of the hive mind team member, the clone. And then below that, they'll pull another, uh, in the, in the, inside that virtual interface, they'll pull up a third screen, which will be a combination of the uh, brainwave signatures, the brainwave patterns of both the, the clone member, the psychiatrist, psychologist, neuroscientist, the, the, the third screen, the drop-down screen inside this virtual interface, inside this virtual environment, will be a combination of both sets of brainwaves of the victim and the, and the cognitive researcher. And so that's called EEG heterodyning. And they mix, they combine, they clone their brainwaves to the brainwaves of the victim. So they're able to using the handlers and operators are, are what you're talking about. And these are neuroscientists, psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, hiding in plain sight, not in some underground base somewhere, but they're actually, you know, out in the field constantly. Many of them, you know, are in the, are in the hospitals, particularly the, the mental hospitals, uh, the, the, the children's psychology, psychology clinics, um, um, the major hospitals, you'll find them there. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the universities, uh, a lot of the neuroscientists uh, and the doctors that are involved in this technology, they're hiding in plain sight. They have careers, they have jobs, they have families, they have mortgages. Um, but they're part of the training, research, and development uh, that, that's being used against the victim. They direct the paradigm against the victim. These handlers and operators are called hive mind team members, and they're able to pull up an entire, only they can see the virtual interface. Only the hive mind team member, they could be sitting right next to you on a plane, and they would be pulling up screen after screen in this virtual interface, but only they could see it because only they possess the electronic brain-to-brain -brain interface. Wow. Okay. Here's another one. Now, as far as interfacing goes, and you've got a, you've got a TI, somebody who's maybe a satanic ritual abuse survivor for many years, decades, uh, not just a kid, and this person would, let's say, 
I saw a movie once, and the person had a, it was a, a little micro cassette, but now it would be a digital recorder. And each day that person would give basically a report of the day's experiences into that little digital recorder. You follow? Now, do they no, have no, people, no. do they have people doing this and then uploading these online to uh, a central collection database to verify that on this particular day, these were the experiences and the sensations and the emotional responses of the targeted individual. Who put them down like a little, oh, I'm keeping a little audio diary. That was the, that was the, the uh, twist. But in reality, it wasn't just an audio diary. It was a field, a field sit rep, a report. Is that something that, that is used to track TIs? No. Um, okay, do you remember when we were kids? Now, today, this would be absurd. No kid would do this. But when you and I were kids, there were, you could go to the, the toy store and you could buy a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Okay? Sure. And you could, you know, it would take weeks or months to finally assemble that jigsaw puzzle, 10,000 pieces, okay? But, you know, as you, as you began to assemble it, you could, you could, you, know, you could get faster and faster, and eventually you, it wouldn't, it, you know, when you first start out, it's very difficult. But as you begin to complete, as each piece of the jigsaw puzzle falls in place, yeah. the, the method uh, of assembling the jigsaw puzzle begins to accelerate. You, you begin to re realize where each piece goes. Well, that's what they're doing to their victims. It's, it's a supercomputer that's doing it. The supercomputer, I'll explain in just a second, is building a jigsaw puzzle, okay, of your, of your will, intellect, and emotion. It's reverse engineering all, the, all seven vectors of the emotional state of the victim to, to create this copycat parallel twin personality of the victim's brain and human soul, will, intellect, and emotion. So think of a jigsaw puzzle, a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, but instead of 10,000 pieces, you're dealing with millions of, of and these pieces are, are synaptic uh, responses. They're neurons inside the, the brain of the victim. Okay, so that's what the system is doing. It's building a jigsaw puzzle. And what, what, what happens is that once you're tied to this supercomputer, you're tied for life. Okay, until the day of your death, the day of the victim's death, you're remote. So tied once you're in, once you're, you are an SRA, DID, survivor slash victim, and you're, that's it for life. You don't get out. Well, you may not be a trauma-based victim. You may be state-of-the-art or, or, or some other mind control program. Okay. Yeah. But what happens is once you're tied, remotely tied, but they basically determine your brainwave signature. Okay. They, they, the hive mind teams get close to the victim. They can do this from great distances now by, to, by establishing timing and location. Okay. So they don't have to be next to the victim anymore. But they can, through a process called directed energy flashing, they can, from thousands of miles away, activate the nanotechnology inside the victim's brain. Again, they don't need nanotechnology for mind control technologies to work properly, but for training, research, and development in a real world, in a real world environment, they do uh -huh. need an amplifier. And that nanotechnology is a bioamplifier. Okay, so this is how it works. Okay, so they determine your brainwave signature. Once the hive mind teams determine your brainwave signature, they take that digital brainwave imprint and they upload it back to their supercomputer, this exascale conscious supercomputer. And then they remote tie you they remotely tie the victim for life to that supercomputer by way of this bi-directional stream remotely by way of this bi-directional stream of energy which begins to map all synaptic responses of the victim's brain okay and 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 it downloads all that information all those synaptic responses back into its database and monitors all electromagnetic activity of the victim's brain for life it's called transcranial brain stimulation the, the the military uses these 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 uh these brain to computer interface. That's the brain to computer interface. That's what's doing. So the system is, is that's downloading all of your responses. I see. Okay, I the, the supercomputer. Well, the, you know, think the F thirty five stealth fighter. Okay, the, is, the, this is a good example. Is a brain to computer interface. The the pilot of the F thirty five stealth fighter does not control the, the the stealth fighter manually if he doesn't have to. He controls the stealth fighter and all the weapon systems, communication, navigation, etc. with his brain. Brain waves. Okay, this is called a brain to computer interface. Okay, well, that's what they're using against their victims. Okay, this brain to computer interface is, is, is that's part of remote neural monitoring and remote neural manipulation. Okay. The first stage of remote neural monitoring. The first stage, what they're doing when they're assembling this jigsaw puzzle is called the first stage, it's called formulation. 
Okay, and formulation is the first stage of remote neural monitoring and is basically the collection and cataloging of data regarding your memories, your memory references. That's synaptic data. Okay, then the, 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 then the next stage is predictive integration, which is, you know, that's remote neural monitoring and it's called predictive integration. And basically it's the interpretation of that data and the manipulation of those memory references. And on and on until you move from remote neural monitoring, which is basically the ability of the system to image, measure, and transmit all neural activity of your brain and central nervous system as it downloads all of that at speed of light. Every time you think of it, remember, energy travels at speed of light. So the supercomputer is able to download your responses, your thoughts, your memories, your emotions, your sensations at speed of light. That's how it's able to attack you so quickly when you think of something using blocking and injection methods. Block your real memories and inject with fabricated and falsified memories. Mm -hmm. Okay? So mm -hmm. the jigsaw puzzle is being assembled. It's being assembled by a supercomputer. There are handlers and operators that get involved, but mostly the handlers and operators are getting involved for verification and other purposes. The, most of the, the again, the, the, the technology is, is all automated, active, and adaptive run by these supercomputers, building a, you know, a million piece jigsaw puzzle of your brain inside its database to achieve direct behavioral control over you. Okay. All right. This, this old movie I saw, the person was, was uh, recording the day's events and it was used somehow in, in data collection and profiling and processing. I'm not, I don't remember what it was. It's been a long time. But uh, so they can do this in real time now from distance they don't need that anymore they don't need no, the person no filtering and and putting into words the feelings and the emotions uh, of the day not at all they don't need any of that and and that's what you know these you know synthetic telepathy and, and, and these these remote neural attacks are all about it's all right. about mapping out the memories of the victim because once the system establishes those memories and verifies those memories they become the next wave the last response of, of, of the victim becomes the pattern for the next wave of torture and harassment because they need to constantly build patterns. So the system will constantly, again, drop you down into a super relaxed or drowsy theta state and begin to use your own memories against you where you have synthetic telepathy conversations with a supercomputer. The supercomputer is actually you know, maintaining a direct auditive uh, uh, conversation with your mind to keep probing you. It's probing you for memory responses. Got it. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. And for most people, it would be verging on the impossible for them to accept that this could be real and could be happening to them. They actually think that they are in charge and in control of much of themselves, when in point of fact, who is themselves? They don't even the know. Psychology, the psychology of deception and manipulation. Wow. All right. Hold on, Brian. Back with more. Okay, and back with Brian, too, talking about something that, for most people, it seems like it's just way out there, too far out there. And for others who have discovered that they are being victimized by this, it's all too real. So this is something you got to keep in mind that has been uh, in the research and development and application and deployment stage since, the, the what, the late... It goes all the way back to Pavlov and the dogs, I guess. But generally speaking, the, the 40s and 50s uh, with Delgado and his work, and, and uh, it has just, we're talking 60 years of, of uh, pedal-to-the-metal research and development with unlimited funds, black ops money. It's, it's pretty grim stuff, pretty grim. Yeah, uh, well, I, I got a, a note from Dr. Eric Carlstrom uh, the other day. He said he goes all the way back to 1953. There you go. I, 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 yeah. Delgado was in the 1960s. But, you know, again, I, I, we are way more sophisticated and advanced today. And, and I, I wanted to, to define what I meant by direct behavioral control because that, might, that, that seems like an ambiguous term. By direct behavioral control, I mean – the, the ability of the supercomputer to define your daily activity, to control your daily activity with these mental suggestions, okay, these, these, these thought-triggered attacks, 
and you know uh, where you know the, the victim can't recognize that the thought triggered attacks are happening because again the system is designed to mimic the victim's normal cognitive behavior. So using that influence, those constant mental suggestions, the, the supercomputer begins to deceive the psychology of deception and manipulation. It begins to deceive and manipulate the victim into making choice after choice. So that the systems, the mental suggestions of the system become acceptable to the victim, hmm. although the mm -hmm. victim doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And so it's impossible for the victim to counter the imposition of these thoughts and impulses when you're being attacked hundreds of times a day. The system begins to control your working state of mind. It begins to control your, your activities and define your, your normal daily activities. And that, that's, uh, you know, uh, people want to know there are ways to defeat the technology. There's, there's multitasking, there's spontaneity, there's redirection. We talked about one of them. It's reading active memory. It's called quenching. Multitasking is simply, uh, using mul thinking or, and, and acting in, uh, in, uh, in multiple thoughts at one time, multiple activities at one time. It creates multiple patterns of thought. Remember, the system is designed to, to determine single coherent patterns of thought which can then be identified, developed, and integrated back into RNN data. Ah, so, so you just you overload the, uh, the receptor, uh, and it, it can't pick up one nice signal to focus on. It's got a lot of noise, and it doesn't know which one to, to look at, so to speak. No, it, 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 can pick up, it can pick up all electromagnetic activity of the victim's brain. Yeah. But it cannot verify. It cannot verify the responses of the victim. Without, without, without verification, there can be no mind control. I understand. Their technology falls yeah. apart. Got it. So one of the ways one of the ways you can defeat their technology is by constantly thinking and acting in multiple threads of thought, so that there's no single coherent pattern for the RNM supercomputer to identify and and integrate back into RNM data. In other words, you don't respond. You begin to control the verification process. So there's no integration completion between your mind and and, and the RNM supercomputer, which is attacking you. So All right. For our listeners to, again, Brian, please define R and M. R and M is, a, is just a. Um, it stands for remote neural monitoring and remote neural manipulation. Uh, remote neural monitoring um, uh, again, the ability of the of the supercomputer to to image, measure, and transmit neural activity of the victims, neural data of Got the it. victims' uh, 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 daily activities uh, of his, of, his, uh, of of the victim's brain. Um, and then remote neural manipulation is simply the ability of the supercomputer to predict and influence the reference choices of the victim during thought composition. Thought composition meaning as the victim is formulating his thoughts and his thoughts and preparing to act, the system needs to be able to predict and influence those that formulation, that 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 the, those thoughts and actions, mm -hmm. okay, to manipulate and deceive the victim by blocking and injection, blocking with real, you know, your fabric, real blocking real memories and injecting with fabricated and falsified memories. So that's the difference between remote neural monitoring and remote neural manipulation. I'll say it again slower, okay, so people can understand. Remote neural monitoring is not mind control. Remote neural manipulation is mind control. Remote neural monitoring is simply. In simple terminology, it is the ability of the supercomputer to collect and catalog information, data regarding your memories, your memory references. So it's the ability of the system, the supercomputer, to image, measure, and transmit your synaptic responses and download all of that neural activity back into its database in real time, speed of light. Remember, energy travels at speed of light. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's remote neural monitoring. It's simple terminology. Remote neural manipulation is far more complicated. It is the after the interpretation of that data, predictive integration. Okay, after that next that last stage of remote neural monitoring comes remote neural manipulation, and that is the ability of the supercomputer not only to predict but to influence your decisions, your choices. Okay, to influence your reference choices, memories during thought composition. As you're formulating your thoughts and preparing to do something, to act, okay, you're, you're, you're going to go to the bank. Well, the, the supercomputer reads that memory, that, that set of brain waves, okay? It's already verified that response before, so it knows where you're going. You're heading to the bank. So it begins to block and inject using blocking and injection methods by way of this fabricated, falsified, bidirectional stream of energy. It blocks the memory of the bank and injects grocery store or, you know, something else to deceive and manipulate you, to control you. 
to define your daily activities, to uh-huh. to shape your thoughts and behavior. So wow. that's the difference between remote when, if you have and if, if, if you know somebody, a friend of yours, a office worker, colleague, whatever, a friend, and you begin to suspect that that person is acting in an, an aberrant pattern. In other words, mm, you would select maybe multiple personality disorder rather than some kind of classical uh, psychological problem area like schizophrenia. Maybe this, this person's got too many variations, too many variants, right? Too many alters. How do you begin to deal with somebody like that? If you've got a friend like that, a couple of friends, whatever, they, they change instantaneously, I mean, and radically sometimes. Well, at times it can be difficult for a person to determine, you know, the technology is, is not only designed to mimic your normal cognitive behavior, it's designed to mimic the dysfunctionality of mental illness. There you okay. go. The technology yeah. is designed right, to make the victim appear mentally ill, to mimic the dysfunctionality of mental illness. Got it. So yeah. the way you look and determine whether or not a person is mentally ill, or you know, are they, are they having you know, are they a victim of mind control? Is to first begin to look for patterns of behavior and responses. You know, if the same patterns begin to happen over and over in a looping pattern constantly, you know, it defies the null hypothesis. It's called the null hypothesis of probability. It's called the null hypothesis of probability. Got it. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a matter, you know, uh, it's not a fact. That, uh, okay, so if you've got somebody who, who uh, exhibits a completely irrational uh, fixation, uh, on somebody or something, uh, and has a, a completely off the wall, uh, uh, emotionally over the top response to that uh, activity or that person, and it flips like a light switch. Boom, 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 boom. You've got you've got issues to be concerned about. I don't know how you'd sit down with that person and talk to him, her, or them, but that would be it. That would be. Uh, I guess. In other words, I guess the the other way to phrase the the uh, the postulate is how do you recognize in somebody an issue that is not mental illness but that is designed as you've said to mimic mental illness i guess when the horses come home to the corral it doesn't really matter if you're really mentally ill or not because you're acting like it uh, in either case well it does matter i mean they oh i know it matters i'm being i'm can't. being facetious yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but no, I mean the, the problem is, I mean that they can create mental illness. They they not just not just mimic the dysfunctionality of mental illness. They can mimic the dysfunctionality of mental, mental illness any time. But they can also create mental illness. Uh, they can create um, a psychosis, you know, through through prolonged sleep deprivation, etc. Uh, force the victim into a, a, a mental institution, and you know he really is mentally ill. He, there's a big difference between mental illness and mental injury. People need to understand this. You know, mind control victims are not mentally ill. They're mentally injured. Big difference, okay? Um, so how do you determine whether a person is mentally injured from this technology right. uh, and um, are, are mentally ill? Well, you know, there are certain criteria that doctors use. That, for example, you know, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia develops sometime in the teenage years and, and early 20s. You know, you don't suddenly develop schizophrenia. Uh, and there are other criteria that the doctors use in the DSM manual and, and, uh, and other medical criteria to determine mental illness. Um, the problem is that the supercomputer, the supercomputer, you know, it's all part of the game, all part of the paradigm. They, you know, they, they, want to, 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 they want the victim himself or herself to believe they have, that they have become mentally ill. Okay, that that they're easily more easily able to force them to become dependent upon the system's output. The way you determine whether or not it's happening is is by testing and validating the memory responses of the victim. In other words, you force the victim into patterns of behavior, patterns of emotions, patterns of of sensations. And if the victim is coherent each time, you know, Dr. Robert Duncan said to me one day, he said, Brian, how do you determine? Whether you know it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, or it's the, the RNM supercomputer, uh-huh. and I said it's easy. God doesn't speak in patterns. 
In what? God doesn't talk in patterns. In God patterns. God doesn't speak in patterns. Right. right. Yeah, patterns. So, um, you know, you, you know, if you force the victim into repeated patterns of responses and he can coherently, you know, answer each, each response, each, each pattern of response, and you can determine that the victim is not mentally ill, but the victim is mentally injured. Very good. Okay. That, that's helpful. There are so many people now. It just, uh, re- reading, reading active memory is basically just keeping a constant handle on your state of activity, as well as your situational perception. Okay. A constant so handle on your state of activity. activity. Hold on. A constant handle on your okay. state of activity. In other words, uh, let's say you did keep a written diary every day. Would that be trying to keep a handle on your state of activity? Or if you spoke into a, a little digital or cassette recorder every day for a half an hour or 20 minutes and, and played it back, would that be a way to try to gain a handle on your state of activity? Be able to uh, a, a way of not only being able to, to handle keep a constant handle on your state of activity, but your situational perception, okay, your thoughts, so that you you can you can keep a constant handle on your state of your thoughts, so, so that you can recognize these conflicting impulses, these uh-huh. conflicting emotions. Where, uh-huh. where, where do these uh-huh. powerful emotions come from? Yeah, you know, I, this is not the way I used to think. You know, the system can literally overpower your impulses, and, and this is how they they force people to commit suicide. The system can can temporarily overpower your impulses, okay? But if you're able to understand the remote neural attacks are happening by testing and validating memory, then you can look and you can begin to recognize the phys- the physical changes, these powerful emotions, these powerful impulses, and then you can reevaluate your current state of mind, your current state of activity. Got it. Very good. Unless you've been tortured, unless you've been tortured to near incoherency, you know, you should be able to fight back and counter the system's influences. You know, if you un- if you have a basic understanding of the technology, you know, and you can read active memory, meaning you can test and validate memory, you can tr- contrast your own normal memory and thought process from all of these patterns, these obsessive compulsive patterns which are are, are developing. Okay. But if you've been tortured to near incoherency with sleep deprivation, torture, et cetera, it's, it becomes more difficult, okay? Right. So, right. You, know, you know, the system is designed to force you to continually respond in patterns, to force you through... Patterns, you know, routines, uh, I got it. Uh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, you, so that's one of the ways you defeat CIA and DIA mind control technologies. It's called spontaneity. You just literally, you, not, not short-term planning. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about not planning at all. I'm talking about speed of thought responses in your life. Remember, they have to verify their technology. They have to not only influence your, your choices, they have mm-hmm. to predict your choices in advance mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. order to determine that their technology is effective. Mm-hmm. So the way, that you, the way that you defeat CIA mind control technologies, the way that you prevent them from building a cognitive model inside their database is by constantly engaging in spontaneous decisions. Speed of thought, not, not short-term planning, speed of thought. So you, as you decide you're going to the grocery store, you yeah. pass a bank, you suddenly decide, I'm going to turn into that bank. Well, for them to verify their technology, they had to predict in advance where you were going. And by suddenly being spontaneous, you uh-huh. just you just broke the pattern that they were trying to right, use right, to verify right. their technology. The pattern, the predict and influence, the pattern was you going to the grocery store. But at speed of thought, you suddenly spontane- spontaneously turned into that bank. You just you just defeated their technology. You just disrupted mind control technology. Now they got to go back and start all over again with a new verification routine. Do they have you to can, pull? You can easily defeat the technology. I got it. Do they have to pull? People uh, in uh, once a year or what or however often, and sit them down and and do some basic programming on them anymore. Do they still do that occasionally, or is are we past all that? Uh, they certainly haven't done it. They haven't done it with me. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I think you know all of it can be. Their laboratory now is basically the, the you know the real world. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they used to need to you know, keep people, you know, but again, they, they, they do need to isolate you because they cannot allow you to engage in a random and chaotic pattern of situations and conversations. Remember, that's street theater. That's organized stalking, situational scenarios and conversational scenarios. 
Right. Well, you cannot, the victim cannot be allowed to engage in a random or chaotic pattern of situations and conversations. It disrupts their technology. So spontaneity is just that. Spontaneity is engaging in random and chaotic situations and conversations. It wreaks havoc in their technology. Absolute hmm. havoc. Hmm. Another way, to, another way to defeat their technology is to break brain entrainment. Um, they're using, whether you realize it or not, they're using, they're using, the supercomputer is using these visual and verbal sequences at the, at the subconscious level. These, these, um, visual and verbal entrainments to keep your brain constantly entrained to the system. Anything which becomes the dominant external stimulus and entrains your brain away from the system to, to, for example, pleasing music, uh, very effective, extremely effective at defeating mind control technologies. Um, it not only breaks brain entrainment, but it temporarily alters your brainwave signature, which their technology is dependent upon. Okay? And there are other ways to create a dominant external stimulus. But you break brain entrainment with the system. And by breaking brain entrainment with, with the system, you disrupt their technology. There's so many ways. Uh, redirection. Redirection is basically establishing a working reference. Um, a working reference is anything in life which makes you extremely happy. Remember, this technology is trauma-based mind control. It's designed to break you down, make right. you sad and depressed right. all the time. Except. They don't like happy. So you I establish something in life. No. So you establish something in life that makes you extremely happy, such as a you know a first love, or the birth of a first child, etc. Okay, a person. Okay. Or music, uh, or sports, me, or good. gardening, or uh, anything that you really have a passion for. They no, don't no, like no, no, no. No, I'm talking about a memory reference. Your redirection is establishing a working memory reference. Okay. External activities do disrupt their technology if they're random and chaotic. Right. Okay. But, but establishing a working memory reference is simply finding something in life which makes you extremely happy. And then every time you're attacked with, by the system, blocking yeah. an injection method, you recognize, you can test and validate memory, so you recognize you're being attacked. You right. see patterns developing. Those patterns tell you you're being attacked. You just think back to whatever it is. It's called redirection. Redirection. You just redirect back to that working yeah. reference. It's a, a, whatever makes you really a safe and sane, that. peaceful, happy, tranquil moment. Some somewhere else. Okay. And in doing so, you just dis you just disrupted their technology. They can no longer. The system can no longer predict and influence. It has to start over again. Wow. Okay. There are, there are many other ways. Controlling the verification process. Controlling the verification process is another way of defeating their technology. Control, in simple terminology, controlling the verification process means refusing to respond. Remember, they need you. They must force you to respond. They must first capture your attention. If they cannot capture your attention, their technology fails. Hmm. That's why the, the organized stalkers are, are told to stare at the victim constantly. Because the neuroprogramming at night and during the day, the, the visual entrainments include two-dimensional images of people staring at the victim. So it's a trigger stimuli. So when the, when, the, when the organized stalkers are staring at you, they're not just trying to harass you. They're using trigger stimuli. Previous neuroprogramming of two-dimensional images of human and biomorphic faces which are staring back at the victim. Okay, so, so um, uh, controlling the verification process means ignoring them. Not responding at all. Hmm. You know, sometimes you can't help but respond, but for the most part, you control your responses by ignoring them. Hmm. You, know, you don't look at them. Uh, you don't pay any attention to them. Uh, they're going to try to, you know, use situations and conversations to capture your attention. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to, uh, based on uh, the profile that they develop of you, um, they're going to come down, they're going to come sit next to you and start having a conversation about your favorite baseball team or your favorite football team or, you know, your favorite religion, uh, etc. They're trying to capture your attention to produce synaptic responses to force you to respond. Hmm. It all begins with their ability to capture your attention. Well, if you refuse to allow them to do that, if you've got headphones in your ears and playing your favorite music, that pleasing music is not only not only breaking brain entrainment with their system, it's not only temporarily altering your brainwave signature, which is what technology is dependent upon, okay? It's also, it's also uh, blocking the street theater. It's also drowning out the conversations and situations they're trying to use to provoke you constantly. So they're going to act in the craziest, most erratic, irrational behavior possible to capture your attention. Because each time they capture your attention, it produces a synaptic response in your brain.
So you control the verification process by refusing to respond. They want to provoke you. They want to get in your face. They uh-huh. constantly want to provoke you into emotional responses, which can be remotely measured and integrated back into r and data. Uh-huh. By refusing to respond, you limit the system's ability to measure, to remotely measure and map out your brain. And every time you, verification every time you fall into it and do essentially what they're looking to trigger, they win. And they continue to build the database and understand. I don't know how many nuances there could be. I guess it's limitless uh, in somebody's oh, response. Let me, let me tell you yeah. something. When I, when, I was, when I was reading Dr. Robert Duncan's resources and other scientists, it, the, the deeper you get, the, the deeper the rabbit hole gets. The, I mean, just, it's, it just really, it's really sophisticated and advanced stuff. Wow. Well, uh, Brian, thank you for that. That was a fascinating walk through a, a part of our reality that very few people get to look at, except for the people who listen to this program. We do try to present all of it. I hope, the, I hope the sound quality is better. I'm sorry about that. There's more games. It's fine. No, we were able to hear everything. Message received. Uh, nothing lost. No problem. None at all. Brian, we'll talk again. Thank you very much. Right. And... Uh, yeah, watch your email. You'll get some good response. Um, take care. Good night from South America. Okay, Brian, thank you. Well, that was pretty wild, huh? Cutting edge, eclectic, esoteric, bizarre, and more. And we will be back with you tomorrow night in 21 hours. Talk to you then. Take care. <laughs>